Rishad, welcome to my podcast and thank you for doing this very early morning in New York, your time. Thank you, Dheeraj. It's uh, great to be here and thanks for inviting me. Yes. So look forward to this conversation, Rishad. I've been following your thinking and the stuff that you're writing and speaking. Uh, have had a chance to hear you a couple of times. And a lot of that you speak about, Rishad, is, uh, as we also spoke, covers four big questions that a lot of us are asking uh, right now, right? I mean, you you talk about uh, how the future looks like, which we are all currently either worried uh, or, or looking forward to, depending on what situation we are in. Uh, and you talk about uh, how do you navigate the change, uh, right? And, and then you talk about uh, leadership and because there are a lot of fundamental changes in the idea of leadership on how do you navigate that. And finally, uh, you know, the fourth pillar of a lot of your work is around uh, building purposeful growth uh, for individuals and for companies. Uh, and I thought that I will navigate our conversation today around uh, these pillars so that we get all that we can uh, from you in this, in this podcast and this conversation. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll begin with the first question, uh, Rishad, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, it's needless to say that the biggest thing staring us in the face is the current pandemic, right? And, and lots have changed, right? I mean, while we talk about technology and Zoom and hybrid work situation and so on and so forth, my mind also goes to the second wave in India, for instance. I mean, we saw pictures that we can never unsee. I mean, we saw bodies floating in the Ganges. We saw mass barriers. I mean, those images uh, uh, would be embedded in our psyche, uh, deep psyche as well, right? So a lot of changes have happened at multiple forums. What, what, what do you see of the future? How is this uh, beginning to be? What should we as leaders, individuals, and companies uh, be thinking about uh, in the near uh, short term and in a, a mid-long term? So I will answer your question by framing it in a slightly larger context, but without a doubt, what the world has gone through, what India has gone through uh, over the past 18 months, when you think about it, we're now getting to August and places started shutting down in March uh, of last year. Yeah. So it's been 18 months um, and, you know, while certain countries seem to be opening up, we have our own issues here in the United States, which is the exact reverse of India, which is in India, there's aren't enough vaccines. In the United States, there are not enough people who are willing to take the vaccines. Yeah. Um, so, but from a very broader context, I've always basically stated that COVID would have far greater implications as we move forward than most people think. And the reason really is um, because A, if you take everybody in the world for 18 months and you basically put them through a health, financial, social crisis um, and no one escapes, you can be rich or poor uh, in any city, uh, you don't escape. Um, what happens is it changes people's minds. Uh, it makes people think differently because we first feel fragile and whenever you're fragile, you know, you stop thinking differently. Then you say, okay, we have to go on. So like in India, like in the US, you try to be resilient. But as you become resilient, you start saying what's important, what isn't important. And then you move from there to, okay, let's get back in some form. And that third phase I call resurrection. So we have fragility, mm. resilience, and resurrection. I would say, you know, India is in the resilient stage, trying to get to the resurrection stage. Parts of the Western world are in the beginning of the resurrection stage and have got through the resilient stage. But when you come out of it, these are the three questions that people are asking. Number one they're asking is, society seems to not be working correctly, which is yeah. number one. Um, number two is people are basically saying business is being challenged in unusual ways. Like in the United States, Boeing almost ran out of money and 
uh, the airlines almost ran out of money, but the airlines for the last three, four years were paying back and either paying dividends or buying back shares and not actually saving for a rainy day. So people said like, all these businesses, who runs them? Like, why do they run the way they do? And then finally, from an individual level, a lot of people basically sort of asked, hey, you know, we have to figure out how we're going to spend time because this clearly has shown that life ends at some part or the other. Yeah. Um, the number that Microsoft has in the United States is 42% of people in the United States are thinking of changing their jobs in the next year. Uh, that happens to be twice as high as it normally is in any year. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. And, and that probably is because of this. So it has really changed how people think about business, about society and about themselves. And those are very broad and very deep. And it isn't just that COVID has basically brought technology forward. Uh, I think COVID has reconfigured what society will look like going forward. And to a certain extent, we don't ever know whether we will be in a post COVID world. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who believe that COVID will be like the flu. We may all need to get vaccinated once a year, uh, and it may be something that hopefully won't kill people, but it will still be around and we won't beat it because um, it will keep morphing and the mutations will keep going because countries like India and Africa and others, people won't get vaccinated in time for people, the, the, the thing will morph. So we may live in a world which will always have COVID hanging around it, but not hopefully this dangerous COVID. And so when people talk about, you know, post COVID, my stuff is like, explain to me where in the world we are post COVID. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that is, you know, that is that. And so I basically use that as a big part of the future. But, you know, I wrote a I've been writing about the future and these four questions. Um, and I sort of state that there are a few things that are happening that drive the future. And there are six of them. One of them, without doubt, is basically the implications of COVID and vaccine drives. Uh, but there are five others. And uh, those five are globalization. India knows about globalization. Yeah. Uh, the second one is demographic shifts, and you see that all over the world. In India, you see it's a country that has lots of young people. It's a country where there's a very big difference between people who live in the rural areas and the urban areas. Um, and it's a country which is trying to recognize the reality that it is actually a multi-ethnic country. Uh, and that you can't suddenly decide that hundreds of millions of people who may not be of one religion or caste don't exist. Uh, no. You can't wish away the world. In the US, it's the same thing. In Europe, it's the same thing. So this whole idea of geography divides, demographic divides, um, and age are a big thing. Uh, the third one really is technology. Uh, and, you know, we've seen the impact of what I call the first connected age, which was search and e-commerce and the second connected age, which was mobile and social. And now we're going to have 5G and voice and AI, and that's going to change society. Um, we are seeing this in, in India. Many industries are being reconfigured, you know, everything from retail to financial to health. People are basically sort of looking at stuff. I mean, if you think about India five years ago without Geo and India today with yeah. Geo, it's a different India. And that's yeah. just, you know, one company with 400 million subscribers. And then there's climate change, which you're beginning to see the impact in India. You're seeing the impact in Europe yeah. with floods. Uh, so, so there's six big shifts of which COVID is clearly one, which accelerates some of these. There's climate change, there's rewiring of major categories, there's technology, globalization and demographic shifts. And what I try to do is explain what these shifts are and then how all of us can continue to operate without going crazy with all these yeah. shifts. Yeah, no, very, very, very interesting framework, Vishal. In fact, we just did, we came out with the culture fuels for 2021, 
which we do at Leo Burnett. And yeah. one of the few uh, really is uh, what we call it BYOS, which is build your own infrastructure, uh, right? So, so we're seeing a huge uh, kind of a, you know, loss of trust uh, in the government to be able to build infrastructure, especially when people had to go out, look for beds, oxygen, uh, you know, hospital facilities on their own. And we're predicting just like in India, every house has its own uh, electricity generator or in, in a small town, rural India, a tube well for your own water supply. We're seeing more and more of that beginning to happen, people building their own, own infrastructure. And that's one of the impact we are seeing of COVID uh, on the society uh, in a market such as ours. I will, however, shift a bit, uh, Rishad, and pick your brains on on, on again, how do you navigate this change that you talk about, right? And uh, in your book, Restoring the Soul of Business, uh, right, you talk about data and you talk about, uh, you know, how uh, more than data, what's important is the human story behind the data. And, and, and uh, you know, data is interesting, but it does tell stories by itself uh, sometimes. But tell us a bit more about in this whole larger world there, where there's almost abdication uh, to, to data and this, uh, we're worshiping it in every uh, format and technology. Uh, what's your sense on how should we be navigating it and how can data be more human if you're to like? So, yeah, so, you know, to a great extent, I truly believe that data while being important should be considered like it's electricity and that without data, many companies cannot operate and data illuminates, it lights up things. But tell me how many companies or how many individuals differentiate themselves by how they use electricity. You go around and saying Leo Burnett is better than J. Walter Thompson because we have electricity. You know, yeah. J. Walter Thompson will say we got electricity too. Yeah. Right. And so this whole idea that people think that data is a differentiator it is a differentiator for a handful of companies. And most of those are not, neither us nor our client companies. It is obviously a differentiator for someone like a Google and Amazon, yeah. maybe a few others, but otherwise it's not that any particular company has unique data. Without data, they can't operate, but without with data that itself isn't enough. So I basically believe what we need to basically do is recognize that data is a form of technology and that in order to be successful, it is how the talent in the company extracts insights, ideas, and wisdom from data. And I, in my book, as well as in my, you know, Substack newsletter, I have described what I call the six I method and the six P method. And the I's are things like, these are not human eyes, but the letter I, it's like inclusive. You know, you can look at the same data and depending on who's in the room, people can actually come up with different answers, which is quite yeah. remarkable. Yeah. So when you're trying to make decisions as a company, make sure that you're including different points of view, because otherwise you won't get the right thing. Or interrogate the data, which is ask where it came from and is it any good, right? The third is interpolate it, because what happens is interpolate, which is look at the data, but then also look at the world around you. If the data seems to be either at odds with what you see around you, try to understand why. And recognize that unless you as a human, you as a team, you as a company, bring something to the data that allows you to extract what I call meaning from the mathematics, right? Mm. Then if you can't do that, then you should be very scared. You should be very scared because in effect, it basically means that you are going to be replaced by a computer. Yeah. Because if you can't bring anything to data, then data doesn't need you. A machine can read it and give you the answer. So I always ask people whenever they show me any data, I say, okay, that's interesting. What are you going to talk to me about? In addition to just saying, okay, here's a spreadsheet because I could read the spreadsheet without you. And so a lot of what I'm now training people to do is what I call provide the four P's, okay? Mm -hmm. And the four P's are, what's your perspective on the data? Tell me how this fits with other things I've seen. Provocation, tell me why this data will make me think differently, right? 
a point of view. What do you think about this? Yeah. Right. And then plan of action. How should I use this? How will this make my life better, my client's life better? And my whole stuff is that's what we need to do with data versus basically coughing it up, right? And saying here is some data. So that is one big thing that I mentioned. And so, you know, that is my basic belief, which is we have to extract meaning from math. Yes, it's important, but alone it isn't. Yeah, no, this is so right because last year we launched an offer called Leo Burnett Consult. Uh, and when we started that, I was being questioned, why would you be doing that when we have so many consulting companies? And my premise was that what we bring together is creativity and technology and data, which nobody else can, right? Uh, a big consulting firm uh, will analyze a lot of data, but they don't have the creativity. And most of our strategy projects, in fact, have creative folks uh, on the team. So we do not do strategy projects only with strategists or, or data analysts. And that is leading to great results. Uh, because it, 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 yeah. Yes, you, you're, doing, you're, you're right. In fact, I remind people that you know, one way of looking at um, creativity is creativity is connecting dots in new ways, right? Yeah. Or connecting dots. And, and data provides some dots. Life provides some dots. Different perspectives yes. provide some dots. And most creative people are actually very, very comfortable with technology. You know, people basically believe that creative people are not. And I say that's not true because if you have to actually think about it, creativity or art, you know, art is where creativity and technology meet. Yeah. Right. So what tends to basically happen if you sort of think about it, the first creatives would basically paint on cave walls. Mm -hmm. And and then when the printing press was organized, they wrote books. And when radio was organized, they basically told stories audio. Yeah. Right. And today in the world where you can basically have everything from augmented reality, virtual reality, mobile video, this allows creativity to actually soar. Creativity yeah. is more important today than it has ever been. So I try to remind people that we are living in a world where we sometimes focus too much on the plumbing and not enough on the poetry. We spend a lot of time trying to find the right person at the right time, but if you don't actually interact with them in the right way, what was the point in the first place? Yeah, no, amazing, amazing. Yeah, because you know it's how you tell the stories and it's becoming more and more critical in today's times. So that's a good segue, Rishad, into my uh, question on technology, uh, right? Uh, I mean, there's so much of conversation around voice, augmented reality, virtual reality, machine learning, and so on and so forth, right? I mean, uh, in India specifically, we're realizing that voice is empowering a large class of people who are not so adept at writing, uh, right? So, so, so voice combined with vernacular, uh, for example, is becoming huge because people can now speak into a mobile phone and ask a question. They're learning. Uh, so education is getting empowered through voice and, and, and vernacular. Uh, how do you see this whole advent of technology and how should brands and businesses embrace it? Uh, again, is this like a mad rush for who makes the next uh, AR video? And how do we navigate this technology in a much more meaningful way? Well, I will go back to the word that you used, which is that I believe that human beings are stories, that all of us are stories. Yeah. And that we tell ourselves stories in order to live. That's what, you know, uh, the writer Joe Didion said. And we make sense of our lives through narrative. Yes. And, you know, to a great extent, um, modern technology allow us to tell stories in new and different ways, sometimes better and sometimes, you know, sometimes reading a book is better storytelling than a multimedia video. Sometimes a multimedia video is more impactful in creating empathy. So for instance, in Davos, people who basically saw a virtual reality show called clouds over cedra which is about a refugee camp were more willing to donate money than if they read stories because they were there mm. they felt like they were there so in many ways you know technology 
uh, should be used for storytelling and for creativity uh, yeah. in ways that make the following things happen. And when you come up with the concept of voice and voice being the key interface for search and a lot of things in India. So what it does is if you notice, ask when you use technology to tell a story, are you making things with the word save, S-A-V-E? What do I mean by S-A-V-E? When you use technology, are you solving somebody's problem? Yeah. So in the case of voice, I might not know how to write and I might have other issues. So if I can speak, you're solving a problem. A is accessibility. Are you making it more accessible? Yes, mm. with voice search, I'm making it more accessible. B is, are you creating something of value? Yes, you're allowing me to basically now search without knowing how to write. And then E, experience. Are you making it a better experience? Yes, it's easy. I can do it from anywhere. So yeah. voice search is that. Okay. Safe. Yeah. But now let's it's save S A V E. But now let's suppose you want to basically say, I'd like you to search by pretending you're in a virtual reality room. Are you solving a problem? Not necessarily. I don't have virtual reality equipment. Is it accessible? No, because unless I have a headset, I can't do anything. Is it valuable? I don't know. Maybe to show off to somebody, but I don't know. And yeah. yes, it probably is a great experience, but I'm not sure it's a great experience to search for things. It might be a great experience to be inside a game. So that's the key thing, which is I always tell people to go back and remember that we are eventually everybody who's using all of these things are human beings and human yeah. beings want things that are S-A-V-E. They don't want technology. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, my belief always has been and being this part of the world, I'm saying, of course, there's there's good use that we can do with machine learning, predicting the new fashion line in Milan. But how about using technology to get access to somebody uh, in, in rural India, right? So one of the things we are trying is to, for Whisper, to keep girls in school uh, by reading the school registers uh, through OCR technology and being able to predict which are the girls who are going to fall off uh, the class because of uh, periods and trying ways to keep her back through interventions. So those are the ways we're trying to use technology to solve real problems in markets such as ours. Exactly, exactly. So I want to move on a bit on the technology piece, uh, Rishad, and I want to ask you about you know the, the largest part of the technology piece seems to be owned by the big techs, right? What we call FANGs, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, right? And between uh, the four of them, they're all platforms pretty much owned by them. Now, the question for companies and brands is that do you, do you submit yourself to this ecosystem or do you build your own platforms? You build your own engagement. Uh, and especially with a lot of clients, we are interacting with they're saying i go to amazon and they ask for 40 percent share of my revenue i want to drive all traffic to my own website i want to own my consumer i want to own the data about my consumer and i want to win uh, using all of that so what what would your guidance be uh, on this uh, i mean how do you use the big tech do you build your own experiences how much to own and how much to ride so i think the answer as you've spoken in your question is you're going to have to do both as well as do things in a phased manner. So my basic belief is that that we are living in a platform based world, but that there are many more platforms than, than these four platforms. Mm. And you're going to see new platforms coming you know, even in India, you're going to basically see Geo trying to create a platform. Yeah. You're going to see, you know, Flipkart creating a platform. So you're going to have many more platforms. And then the other thing that's going to happen is in order for people to grow, they're now going to add capabilities that each other has, right? So for instance, in the US, Amazon is bigger in search for anything that's e-commerce than Google is hmm. already. Yes. And, and, and just you know, in that phase, um, 
I'm speaking tomorrow to Snap Management and they are doing very well and they are working very hard, for instance, as augmented reality. So one is that I would encourage marketers to try to spread, even though sometimes it may not be the most cost effective way of doing things, is to spread their dollars across more than the three or four platforms. So fund the competitors to a certain yeah. extent because it's good for you in the long run which is number one. The second is, especially for marketers, CMOs, chief media officers, is to try to get to the boardroom and explain why there are going to be certain decisions that you are going to make that are going to hurt the bottom line in the short run, but will manage to keep the company strategically independent in the middle to long run. Yeah. So, what happens is we do a lot of work with the platforms because they're so effective. But there are three challenges with those platforms. The first is they extract a large sum of money, both coming in and going out. There is a company, for instance, called CloudStrike. Uh, I mean, sorry, um, yeah, CloudStrike, uh, that basically is now telling Am folks that Amazon lets you get onto their cloud for free but if you want mm. to take your data out, they charge huge amounts of money. Yeah. So they actually, even if it's your data, they make it so yeah. hard for you to extract from their cloud, right? Uh, or they take their data and they come up with competitors. Uh, so literally they create, they, they figure out what's selling well, and then they make a private label version of exactly the same thing. Wow. So Amazon does that. Google, yeah, for instance, course, yeah. if, you search, if you search for travel on Google, uh, most of the returns that come back are not actually people who are bidding on travel words. It's Google properties because Google yeah. is trying to vertically integrate into travel. Right. Yeah. And so that's the other. And then the last one, which is very important, is they can reduce you to nothing but a factory. If they own the data, they own the customer relationship, they own the marketplace, then a brand marketer is nothing but a factory. So yeah. I try to remind brand marketers that this is also about your career. It's not just about your company. You won't have a career. So you yeah. need to think in medium to longer term. You can't live without the platforms and there are ways to partner with the platforms, but you need to have optionality because if you don't have strategic yeah. optionality, then you have nothing. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean. The whole idea, as you said, fund the enemy uh, in the in the middle term, uh, so that you have yeah, a long term. Yeah, yeah. You fund the enemy. You explain to your board why you're investing in also creating direct relationships, yeah. right? And doing things that don't make the f either require investments or you don't aren't buying the cheapest option right now. Yeah. Primarily because you're trying to think about the medium to long run, but yeah. at the same time you have to work with these platforms because you can't operate without them. Yeah, the short run. No, absolutely. There is no free lunch, right? I mean, you will get locked and you'll have to pay the cost. So this is going absolutely fantastic. Shaz, welcome back uh, to the conversation. Uh, it's a great conversation. Your early morning, our, our late evening, uh, in fact. Yes. Uh, so I want to probe a little bit uh, more about uh, leadership and how the idea of leadership is evolving and how do you see that? I was, in fact, speaking to another colleague of mine uh, in one of the earlier podcasts, Freddie, who's just done a PhD uh, on Asian model of leadership. And we were discussing how the Asian model or the new emergent model of leadership is far more connectivist. It's far more family led, far more empathy led rather than the, the classical American model of leadership, which is hero based uh, format of leadership. In fact, we were doing a town hall a few months back, Rishad, in India, and we were using words like love and family. And somebody pointed out in that agency town hall chat that this is the first time in a town hall we've seen management use words such as love uh, and and family so i want to understand from you how do you see the idea of leadership uh, you know shape up in the world in today's times and what do leaders uh, need to embrace and what do ne they need to watch out for in in this context sure so i have written and thought a lot about leadership because it is extremely important and what I will do is I will answer your question uh, in three different ways. Uh, the first one is basically, I'm going to, before getting to the different kinds of leadership, I'm going to 
identify six components of what makes a good leader um, yeah. today. And those six components are uh, both achievable and usable by any individual inside any company or anybody who's listening to this. The first mistake that people have made is to be a leader means you need people to follow you. That's not true. A boss is not the same thing as a leader. You can be a leader yeah. without anybody reporting to you because the six components of leadership are the following. The first one is competency. You can't be a good leader unless you know what you're talking about. You can't be great, a creative leader if you don't know creativity, right? Yeah. The second one is what I call time management, which is not only managing your own time, but making decisions like, what do I make decisions in the short run and what decisions do I make in the middle to long run? So deciding sometimes that you are going to take a hit in the short run because it makes more sense in the middle run. Like how do you work with the platforms, for instance? Yes. The third one is basically integrity. And integrity is not only trust, but things like transparency. How do you make your decisions and intent? What are you trying to do? So if someone knows what you're trying to do and how you make your decisions, then even if they don't know you for a long time, they will come to trust you. Um, yeah. So those three are what I call sort of left brain, which is fact-based, uh, competency-based, time management-based decisions. Uh, the other three are far more emotional. This is to your point. One of them yeah. is basically uh, empathy, being able to understand from other person's perspectives. Uh, vulnerability, being vulnerable by basically saying, you make mistakes, you don't have all the skill sets, you need to surround yourself with other people, being open to people telling you and pointing out that there are issues. And the last one is inspiration because leaders inspire people uh, because people choose with their hearts and they use numbers to justify what they just did, right? So yeah. if you look at those six characteristics, which are competency and trust slash integrity and um, time management on one end and vulnerability, empathy, and inspiration, uh, you'll see that some of them clearly are much more emotional and human, and some of them are a little bit more rational. But all six actually do not require you to basically be a control and command leader. And mm. in fact, this control and command leadership is probably at greater risk and it isn't even today as much as a Western and Eastern centric. Right. Um, it is a organization centric versus a human centric. That's the way I look at it. Right. Okay. And because of COVID, a lot of things that was an organization is being challenged. So yeah. a lot of the large, if you think about a thought, you know, if you think about like I'm in charge type of companies, it's the financial companies in the United States, yeah. Goldman Sachs, uh, you know, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan Chase. So their CEOs, all of whom are older white men, have basically told all their employees that they have to get back to work. The people who don't get back to work five days a week are not hustling and they don't know what to do. And what is beginning to happen is large groups of people are refusing to come back to work because they're basically saying, explain to us why, if we're a mother with a child who's not going back to school yet, why do we have to come to work when productivity yeah. and profits did perfectly well? Why do we, it has to be five days a week? Why don't we have flexibility, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden, these three people are beginning to realize that in many ways, their leadership was about monitoring, controlling, commanding, and having a campus and a cult-like thing. But yeah. with people who can now engage with everybody, connect with everybody, talk with everybody, what is a leader? Leadership skills are very different today. They're the ones I describe. They're yeah. not about keeping people on time, fear, command yeah. and control, because that not only has COVID changed, but there's a generational thing. You know yeah. that younger people in your organization, if you treat them the way that maybe your bosses 10 years treated you, they'll quit on you. There's no way, yeah, absolutely. <coughs> yeah.
I mean, it's very interesting, Risha. You talk about vulnerability, right? And as a leader, yeah. right? I mean, you've always been taught that leader needs to know the direction. The leader uh, needs to be confident. Must you must always signify uh, that you are in control. Otherwise, uh, you know, you're not sending the right signals. And here you're saying that you know vulnerability is actually a a good trait to have for today's leadership. Yes, it is a very good trait to have for three very important reasons. The first reason is believability. If, for instance, you say, I'm not sure exactly what we need to do, I need to get input from other people, and then you make a decision, people will believe you. Or yeah. at times when you say, I know the way, but because people have heard you at other times saying you're not sure and you need people's input, they will believe you. So just saying, I have the answer, people don't necessarily believe you. If you yeah. basically show how you're getting there, people believe you. That's number one. The second why vulnerability is important is most companies and most leaders fail because they self-destroy themselves. Okay, Companies have problems, but people are not willing to address or speak about them. When a leader says, I have the answer, I don't need to listen to anything, people don't come to them and say, hey, we have a problem either with a client or with our work or with yeah. something, and we need to address it. And then the problem festers and blows up on their faces. So vulnerability, the second thing it basically says, it allows you to identify problems. So one is it allows you to be more believable. Yeah. Second is it allows you to identify problems. But the third one, which is extremely important, is we're living in a world that regardless of how good you are, the world is too complicated for any one person to be able to solve it. Yeah. Okay. Now, there are some people who can work solo, like I now work solo when I write, I don't have like a committee writing with me, right. Yeah. But the rest of the time I'm working with lots of different people and learning from lots of people which I then write about I'm not like writing about the only thing that I've learned by myself, nobody would be interested They say that's what yeah. who cares about that. Right. So that basically means you're surrounding yourself with complementary skill sets. And therefore, by vulnerability, you pay much more attention yeah. to other people's points of view. So for those reasons, the best leaders are vulnerable. Hmm. And it, it and when some, and, and, Yeah, and when someone basically says, I know the answer, get out of the way, be very careful, they probably don't. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you're saying it actually helps you up your own game, right? Because uh, it ups you're your own game. a lot more yeah. help. You're getting a lot more help, you're getting a lot more input. And also then when you make your decision, people believe you. Yeah, no, this is interesting because you know one of the things we did, Rishad, when uh, the pandemic hit, uh, we uh, we built a platform of fifty people, uh, and these are top leaders of Leo Burnett, right? And it's not because of their seniority. I mean, we have very young people in that platform as well, and we meet every Tuesday without fail, ten thirty. It's fixed, right? Never gets changed, and we discuss what's the, I mean, what's the agenda? How are we faring? What does we need to do? And for last about eighteen months, we've been doing it every week. And it's interesting how it's brought everybody together across three offices, right? And we are collectively taking decisions and we fared rather well through the pandemic because of this collective decision yes. making. Yes, it, it, it is, it is, and it, it, it helps a lot. And what will happen is hopefully in India, like everywhere else in time, there'll be an opportunity to go back to offices and you know go back to work in a particular way. But what I would suggest to people is when you go back, you don't go back, you start reinventing new ways of working, which combine yeah. the world of 2019 with the world of 2020 and 2021. Yeah. Because here's what happens is if you try to get 50 people in a room in the physical world across all yeah. your offices, it's logistically it'll, impossible. it'll be logistically impossible. You've now been able to do yeah. things. The other is you've been able to get more people and more perspectives and more points of view. Yes. So, you know, in the United States, they talk a lot about, hey, I want diversity. Well, diversity means you have to also be flexible about where people work and how they work, because otherwise yeah. you may not get the people you need. There may be people you need from a particular city who can't afford to live in an expensive city. You may need yeah. to get mothers who have to look after kids or people who are looking after their parents. So, you know, in effect, one of the big things I suggest to people is as we come back to work, right? Uh, we have to think about the unbundled workplace, which is yeah. work is no longer going to be just an office. It's yeah. going to be an office, a home, an experience, everything else. 
Yeah, and that also then redefines what the office is going to be. And as some of the thinking is that perhaps office is the place where you collaborate and maybe home is the work when you do individual contribution work. Yes, exactly. And so, you know, one of the things I have written about, um, and, you know, you'll be sharing this with both your organization and on this particular thing, is I have this sub stack, which is it's a free email newsletter. Um, and it's at rishag.substack.com. And you can look at the archives, et cetera. Yeah. But it's been very popular. It's, it's read by about 20,000 executives every week already. Wow. And it's completely free, yeah. including about 250 to 300 CEOs of companies. And one of the, th I've written about the future of work and I've written about the future of the office. And yeah. one of the pieces I wrote was called the jigsaw of return, which is how yeah. you come back, right? And that has become so popular that literally I go to boardrooms telling them or sharing why I wrote what I wrote. And yeah. because I come up with an approach which is much more human to your point and much more uh, humble. So I don't have yeah. a thing that says, this is the way, right? I yeah. basically say, hey, look, this thing is being unbundled. We've got these four different things. How you combine them depends on what you are trying to do as a company, what your culture is, who you are, what industry you're in. But regardless of what you do, here are a few things you want to do. And the three things I suggest to people is number one, is before you tell people to come back or how to come back or what to come back, why don't you first talk with everybody or as many people as you yeah. can, right? Get people's input. The second is that when you, before you say, here's what we're going to do, basically say here is what we believe right so for instance you might say look leo benan happens to be in the business of creativity collaboration and working with clients and yeah. as a result we believe there is going to be a requirement for some physical interaction both with clients and as teams because we believe that's important in our business because if we don't serve our clients sometimes by going to them we may be at a competitive disadvantage right yeah um, we believe that we need to sometimes get together to train, to collaborate, and to create ideas. So we believe that some of these things are necessary for us to physically get together, right? Yeah. On the other hand, we also believe that as we have shown that there are ways to run companies, 50 people all together, lots of other things, which we can do virtually. So we believe that in, as we move forward, there are some things we need to do physically, some things we need to do virtually, and some things we can be flexible about. So you put down beliefs. And then the last yeah. thing you say is based on listening to people and what our beliefs are, here is how we think we should start as we come back to work, but we're gonna think about things like software. So we're gonna start with this version, we're gonna learn and then we're gonna adapt the version. Yeah. And as a result of this, every company can basically go forward and people will not say, you are not listening to us, right? I've heard you, I understand why you're doing what you're doing, we're experimenting. And then at some particular stage, you will make certain decisions and some people will not be happy, but they can't say you did not iterate, you yes. did not learn, you did not put yeah. principles, they just will be unhappy. And then you'll say, hopefully you'll still stay, but we can't make everybody happy. But if you basically say, I know the way, this is what yeah. we're gonna do, you're just gonna it's piss off everybody. Yeah, right. So this is amazing. This is a fantastic playbook on, on return to office or, or return to office and home yes. together. Yes, yeah, yeah. so, so it's, it's, called, it's called the jigsaw of return, uh, which yes. is, you know, you can put it in the show notes or whatever, but it's at yes. rishal.substack.com. That's amazing. It's awesome. Vishal, I want, to, I want to shift gears to, and I want to discuss uh, and pick your mind on the idea of purpose, right? I mean, in today's times, we, we stand at a strange, strange point in time, right? I mean, we've come a long way discussing purpose for brands, companies, people, and so on and so forth, to the extent that we went uh, at it uh, to a degree of fault, right? We started work washing it, right? I mean, uh, especially our industry in advertising. I mean, at some stage, we started picking up things for the sake of it with very little skin in the game. So so purpose went to that extent where, you know, I mean, you, you, you couldn't separate whether the brand or the organization really uh, cares for what, what they're talking about. At the same time, with what has gone along for last 18 months, right? it's all about empathy, it's about people, it's about you know, what do we need to do for the larger world, for the society? So how do we as, as companies and brands and, and people navigate the idea of purpose? How do we stay true uh, to, to what we stand for? What are your thoughts in, in this area? 
I think what's very important is purpose is important for two reasons. The first is if you look at most uh, brands, uh, people are basically asking, what do the brands stand for? What do they believe in? And what good are they doing to two types of ESG? So I basically call it two types of ESG. So ESG is originally known as E is for environment, mm -hmm. S is social and G is governance, which yeah. is the first thing people say is, what is the company doing with regard to the environment? What are they doing social and how are they governing themselves, right? Yeah. There's another ESG, which is a second ESG where the E stands for employees. How are you looking after your employees? S is society around you physically and where you work, how are you helping society? And G is government. Are you paying your taxes and how are you working with the government of the country yeah. or the neighborhood? And unless companies solve for that, they're going to have a very hard time doing two things, selling brands on a differentiated basis, because they can't talk about purpose and values if they don't care about employees, environment, social society, yeah. governance and government. But as importantly, they won't be able to attract and retain talent. I don't have the numbers, obviously, for India, but I have the numbers for the United States, where I live right now. And many people who are under 35 years old truly believe they will not join companies where they don't believe the company has a sense of purpose. Yeah. Right? So purpose is not optional. It's necessary. But what's important is purpose isn't about communicating that you're going to do great things. It's about actually doing it. Yeah. Right? Because nothing is anti-purpose as talking about a purpose and not actually doing it. Yeah. Because that, you might as well just keep quiet. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, amazing, you know, and uh, you know, even in the Indian context, right? We're realizing that we are in a market where, you know, brands need to play what I call a socio-capitalist role, right? They need to play a role in elevating people's lives uh, because if you're not part of the society, uh, you know, you have a role to fulfill that you can't just be fair with the friends. In fact, I was talking to somebody from, uh, venture capital the other day and we're realizing that there's a huge spurt of direct to consumer brands in personal care and these brands are giving the legacy brands are run for money because of the transparency and honesty that they're coming with they're revealing what what uh, you know where their products are coming from what kind of people they're employing are their farms friendly uh, right what are their labor laws and that's becoming a big currency for the d2c brands yeah so what I would basically say in, 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 in many ways is uh, that what we have, to, we, have to, we have to think about is this, that there's a comp that all the companies that are succeeding today are companies where the customer basically wants to know about how the product is made, where it's made, how it's made, and who is impacted by what it's yeah. done. So there is a company uh, you may have heard of in the US called Warby Parker. Yeah. And Warby Parker basically makes glasses, okay? Uh, of cells, frames, and glasses. And the way they launched, and you can see, I, I think it's still on their website, is they basically said, okay, we are Warby Parker, this is why we can sell our glasses at half the price of anybody else, but why we're going to show you that it's exactly the same glasses. So they actually do an education on the supply chain and they show a company called Luxottica that owns every component of the supply chain, but it eventually goes to the same factory. So they say we, we make it from the same factory. But yeah. Luxottica then keeps selling to itself and each section box it up. We just basically bring it to you from the factory. Amazing. Yeah. Our profit margin is this, it's 15%. We make this much money because we can't make, yeah. we have, we're showing you how much we make, right? They make 15% again and again and again as they resell to themselves to, before they come and sell to you. 
And by the way, what we'll also do is for every pair of glasses you buy, we'll give a pair of glasses free to somebody who needs it. Amazing, yeah. Okay, and, and then the other thing that they said is, okay, we're now online, but to make your life, and then they go to save, S-A-V-E, right? What do they do? They say, okay, you need a pair of glasses. We'll give you a solution. We'll give you the pair of glasses. Select any three, four pairs online, and we'll ship all four of them to you. Try them at home and return the three you don't want. Awesome. Accessibility is okay. You don't like doing online. They open up both real stores and pop-up stores you can walk into in different cities. Yeah. Value and values they've shared. They're both giving to people who can't afford it, and they're showing their value by showing how they make money and it's half the price. And the experience is whether it's their website or whether it's their stores is absolutely incredible and you feel good about it. Excellent. That's superb. Vishal, it's a great conversation having you, right? But before before I, I, I end my questions, I can't, I can't but ask you, I'm there's so much that you're writing, there's so much that you're thinking. I want to understand from you, how do you manage all of this? I mean, what's the, what's your, uh, you know, key to manage time and how, what's your key to create so much of thinking and content? So thank you for saying that. So I think there are two or three things that I do and I encourage people if they'd like to do the same things because none of them can't be done by everybody. Okay. So the first one is I basically set aside an hour a day for learning. Wow. And uh, so my whole basic belief is just like you might set an hour to either exercise or an hour to watch television or an hour to do social media, uh, set aside an hour for yourself, because if you don't learn, you won't grow. So yeah. I set an hour for learning. And as I'm learning, as I'm learning at the end of every hour of learning, I say, OK, what did I learn this past hour? Sometimes I said, I've tried to learn, but I learned nothing because it's not like every time you learn something, yeah. you learn something. You, you say, oh, I didn't learn anything. It was pretty stupid what I read or what I saw. But, you know, and then, and then you, if it's stupid, then you say, why was it stupid, right? Was yeah. it stupid because you did not understand it? Or can you learn from why they did not communicate well or whatever it is? Yeah. So that's the first thing you do. The second, which is extremely important, is try to think about how you can help people. And mm. everybody, even if you're like a, you know, one year out of school, there's something that you know, or something that you can help somebody with. Yeah. Right. And after 40 years of work, I figured out that I can help people see, think and feel differently. Okay. Amazing. About how to grow themselves, their teams and or their companies. And so my whole stuff is I can help you see, think and feel differently. So that's what I will do. And then the third and the last thing, is you decide how you're going to do it, right? So one is you learn, because if you don't learn, you've got nothing yeah. to say, yes. right? Yeah. Then the second is, okay, what? how can you help? I mean, I can learn a lot. I, I know a lot of different things, but a lot of those, it's, I'm not really good at it. I've learned it, right? But yeah. there are other things that I'm actually over time supposedly good at. So I said, I can help in that way. But then how do you do that help, right? Yeah. And, and so in my particular case, I've come up with a model, but everybody can come up with their own model. Mine is a little bit more sophisticated because I'm now, you know, a full time, I do this full time. Um, yeah. And I'm not I have a full time job like everybody who's probably listening to this has a real job and mine is I work, but it's not a real job, because I don't have a boss. And I don't have, you know, clients and things like that, which are hard to work with and do whatever. <laughs> but I basically do three key things. I share in a so in a one to many way a one to some way and a one to one way. Mm. And what I basically say is my one to many way is going to be through writing. So yeah. I said, if I'm going to help people, I'm going to help them through writing. But how do people today like to get information? Some people like getting it through a book. I've written a book. Okay. Some people would just like reading it in snack like formats. So that's why I've started my Substack. Right. Yeah. Some people just want to listen to it. So now my Substack, I can have also made into audio podcasts. Yeah. Right. So again, making it accessible. So I'm solving yes. by helping you. And then, and then, and then in my one to some is speaking. Yes. Like I'm doing with you. Right. Yeah. So 
in this particular audience is people who listen to this podcast. So it's yeah. one to some, or I will go to an event. And then one to one is where I basically advise, you know, C level executives and small teams. So therefore, I say, okay, if this is how I'm going to help people. I have to write. And if I have to write, let me make a discipline of writing. So what I do is every Saturday, I spend three hours writing what people read on Sunday in six minutes or 10 minutes. Amazing. And, and what people basically, Ernest Hemingway said something very smart. He basically said, I would have written a shorter letter if I had more time. Yes, I agree with you. Absolutely. Right. And so people say, your stuff is really well written. And in, you know, between 1500, 1000 to 2000 words, you cover an entire subject, right? And you use good language and you don't use any terminology. And it shows that you spent a lot of time. It only takes us six, seven minutes to read, yeah. right? And I said, yeah, because I'm taking seven, eight, seven to 10 minutes of your time. I want to make sure that you think it's worth giving up, right? Yeah. And, and so that becomes the entire thing. And so I tell people, hey, and, and it's, there's a discipline. I do this every, I read every, I study one hour a day. Every Saturday, I set aside three hours for writing this, right? And, and so it's a discipline. And my whole thing is I, I do it because I like doing it. I can help people doing it. And once you have those two things where you love doing something and in loving doing it, it helps other people, you'll just keep doing it. Yeah. But initially, when you start, start about how can you help people and what are you good at, and then build yeah. your skill. And that's the thing also that I, the reason I remind people is people get like fascinated, like I learned how to use sub, a sub stack, you don't have to learn how to use. But like, how come you started this newsletter, or yeah. this thought letter, and learned the technology and, you know, obviously, I, I'm not charging and give it away for free, etc. I said, I want to learn because I think there are big implications about what happens when all of us become creators. Right. So yeah. I said, I've become a creator. I have a little media company read by 20,000 people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so those are things I encourage everyone to do, which is let nobody tell you that you're not great. You're great at something. Just figure it out. That's awesome. Thank you so much. That's so encouraging. I mean, that's one of the reasons I got into podcasting. I said, if I have to understand how this platform works, I might as well do it uh, and figure that out. What was the first thing you do when you enter a meeting? I, I look at the energy in the room, right? I'm a big believer in what's the energy in the room. And, uh, you know, if it is too stuffy, I, I try to get in and crack a joke and make it easier. So I, I look at the energy and I try to calibrate the energy uh, to the agenda that uh, we are getting in the room for. Fantastic. And if a movie was made of your life, what genre would it be? Yeah, that's a tough one. I don't know. It would be, I think it would be some kind of a Woody Allen movie with lots of layers in it, definitely. Well, what I yeah. think you should basically do is be a new Avenger. They're looking for Asian and Indian Avengers in the Marvel world. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that that's what you could basically be. Yeah. You know, determined yeah. Dheeraj or something like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. That could be, yeah. That could be my future. Perfect. Yes. Uh, you, you speak a lot about leadership. So what are you going to do to continue to ensure that you continue to grow and develop as a leader? Yeah. I mean, obviously, as you said, uh, one is learning. But the, but the big thing here, uh, Rishad, is that I'm being able to do several mini experiments and, and I'm learning from them, right? So, uh, you know, when pandemic hit, we said, why, why does decision making has to be at the, at the head of the table? Why can't it be democratic? And we located this 50 people uh, kind of a board and we are making decisions. So I'm learning a lot by doing, I'm, I'm doing these mini experiments uh, and, and learn. I think a big part of my learning is coming from there and growth is coming from there. Got it. Perfect. And uh, I talked about like spending at least an hour of learning every day. How many hours do you read in a day? Very little, actually. I'm 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 sp I'm spending time listening. So what I have done is I have I have combined listening to podcasts uh, and my walk uh, and exercises that we do. So that's one hour I do two things for myself. Perfect. I have a recommendation for both you and your uh, audience on a very good podcast, you can find it basically at fs.blog. So fs, 
dot blog. Yes. It's called the Knowledge Project. And it's a gentleman called Shane Parrish who talks to yeah. um, a major leader. And we yeah. actually have him in the lab program. So every oh, month wow. I, yeah. I, I interview Shane him. I'm following Shane on Twitter. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so, so he's as part of the lab program. I have him every every month talking to him and what he learns. That's and awesome. Then what is the, and then what is the one characteristic that you believe every leader should possess? I would say in today's time, empathy, right? I mean, uh, and and I would elaborate on that. I mean, I'm I'm very particular not to do to people everything that I didn't like uh, growing up, right? So in early early stage of my career, I really fought very hard for autonomy. I was being told you're young and we can't feel you and so on and so forth. So at Leo Burnett, actually, we've created a structure where we empower very, very early. I mean, we are give, giving young people the chance to front end, front lead. So that's been my my principle of not doing anything that I didn't like growing up. Fantastic. Well, you know, with what I know, you've basically not only are a very good leader, but you continue to sort of improve. So uh, Leo Bennett is, you know, uh, lucky to have you. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's great also to be on this particular sort of show. And um, hopefully everybody who's listening to this, as well as other folks can read some of the stuff that I write and you'll share that with them. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, for taking this time, uh, Rashad, it's been awesome for us. Uh, so really lucky to have you on this podcast. Well, thank you for inviting me. In order to learn more about my writing and my thinking, you can follow me on Twitter at Rashad. That's at R-I-S-H-A-D. Uh, you can subscribe to my free email newsletter, which is at Rashad, R-I-S-H-A-D dot substack. S-U-B-S-T-A-C-K dot com. Or you can also find me on LinkedIn or at RashadTobaccoWala.com. Thank you.